Welcome to Book Club with Jeffrey Sachs. I am absolutely delighted and thrilled to have uh, two colleagues and uh, superstars uh, on uh, today for a discussion of a, of a wonderful new book. First, uh, Professor Richard Laird, uh, Lord Richard Laird uh, of uh, the House of Lords of uh, the United Kingdom, who is uh, one of uh, the world's gurus on our topic today, uh, happiness and well-being. Uh, and uh, he's a professor uh, emeritus at London School of Economics. I take emeritus to mean just filled with merit because uh, not, nothing slows down with Richard in, in the slightest. Uh, he is uh, the founder director of the Center for Economic Performance and now leads LSE's Center Program on Well-Being, which is the topic of our discussion. And another uh, dear friend and superstar in the area of well-being and, and happiness is uh, Professor Jan Emanuel Deneb, who is at Oxford University, and he directs uh, Oxford's Well-Being Research Center, and he studies uh, our topic, well-being in many, many different ways, well-being in, in the workforce, well-being in the environment. And uh, both uh, uh, Professor Laird and Professor Deneb are co-editors with me, I'm happy to say, uh, in the World Happiness Report. So uh, after today's podcast, you will all get online and look at the 2023 World Happiness Report. This is a uh, an activity that um, Richard inspired in many, many important ways for all of us uh, more than a decade ago uh, to get started. Now, today we're talking about really a fantastic book, so uh, I could not recommend it more strongly. It's a wonderful balance of a thorough uh, and sagacious, wise overview of the topic of well-being and how to achieve it, and with a, a lot of um, just beautifully uh, snuck in technical uh, details. So you learn a lot about uh, statistics and econometrics even, and inference and uh, avoiding uh, pitfalls in reasoning. So it's, it's actually a book that goes well beyond the topic of well-being, science and policy, which is the subtitle. Uh, it really goes to good reasoning uh, and uh, a logical approach to this issue so that we can understand what, what the evidence is. And by the way, one of the reasons I like it so much, there are many reasons, it's a terrific book. Uh, and it, as far as I know, it's really the first textbook uh, of its kind, which is a thorough, introduction, really smart and wise of this whole topic. The first textbook, I would say, in the past 2,300 years, because there was a very good textbook written around uh, 330 BC by uh, a, a really good researcher on this topic, Aristotle, uh, in Athens. And one of the reasons, uh, by the way, for both of you that I like this so much is that your, your table of contents actually follows a almost Aristotelian approach uh, because Aristotle wrote the first textbook on this topic. Um, it's called the Nicomachean Ethics. Uh, Nicomachus is the name of Aristotle's son. Uh, it's a bunch of lecture notes, actually, most likely. It seems to have been collected by his students uh, as uh, lecture notes. Uh, it's sometimes said that he wrote it as a kind of self-help guide for his son. Uh, here's, how to, here's how to be happy. Uh, but it's your table of contents, which is fantastic, really, um, uh, really uh, thoughtful and, uh, and comprehensive takes the approach that Aristotle takes, and that's what we're going to take in our discussion. It starts out with the question, what is happiness? Uh, and then it goes right to the question of human nature, which is actually pretty core Aristotle, uh, what makes us tick. And then you go through 
all of the different dimensions of our lives, actually, because they all play a role. And then you end up with what government can do. And just to, not to talk any longer, just to say that Aristotle finished his textbook on well-being, the Nicomachean Ethics, by saying, now we go to the next volume, politics. So he wrote, actually, a companion volume on politics, what should government do? You have that in three chapters. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, with the... I'd say more mathematical precision uh, than <laughs> Aristotle, but uh, really you're in a long line of uh, 2,350 years of uh, tradition. So I congratulate you. And I think it's the finest textbook on this subject for at least a couple millennia. So uh, thank, you, th- <laughs> thank you for that. So let's get into it. Uh, Richard, uh, what is the case for well-being? That's, that's the opening of, of, of the book. Yes. Well, of course, um, you have to have some overarching objective if you're make, making difficult choices between alternatives. That applies to the government uh, deciding how much to spend on education or, or the transport or whatever. Big, difficult choices. Uh, it also applies to us. We've got to make big choices of what jobs to do, um, how to conduct our family life and so on. There's got to be some overarching objective against which you measure the value of all the alternatives. Uh, and we say that it is the well-being of the community. That's that's the overarching objective. Uh, how do we get there? Well, you might say, well, uh, the uh, wealth is very important, uh, or the health is very important, or the freedom is very important. Uh, I would say, well, why don't we ask why these objectives are important? Why is wealth important? Well, it, it enables you to have a more enjoyable life. Why is freedom important? Because slavery makes you feel terrible. Why is health important? If you're sick, you feel terrible. Then you say, why does it matter how, how we feel? You can't give an answer. There's no answer. It's self-evident. This is self-evidently the thing which matters most, and other things matter because of how they contribute to it. So that's that's the argument, uh, and uh, I think it, it is is critical to f- if people object to it, that they uh, face up to the issue. Well, what is your alternative criteria to this? And you'll find that none of the people who object to this uh, are able to provide an alternative. In which case, they're just not able to answer the basic question uh, that's re- requiring answering. Um, so that would be my, my justification for the case. Now, then you come, of course, to can you measure it? Uh, we say, yes, you can measure it. You can ask people questions. This has got a lot of information content. Uh, we know uh, that uh, what people say about how happy they are, this is one of the best predictors of how long they'll live, for example, as good as a medical diagnosis, good predictor of how they'll vote, how they're productive they will be, how, whether they'll stay the course in their job or even their marriage. So there's a lot of information content in these answers. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's not only, as I was saying first, a desirable <laughs> criterion, it's also a feasible uh, criterion. Um, and we now know a lot about what causes it. Uh, and, uh, and until we knew what caused it, um, there was a bit of a difficulty in applying it. So, um, uh, as you were saying, Jeff, it goes back 2,300 years, but it got a big revival uh, in the 18th century Enlightenment. And, of course, it influenced people, um, but it got undermined in the 20th century. Well, before we get there, we're, go- we're going to get uh, we're going to cover all those grounds. But uh, uh, Yana Manuel, uh, if you want to come in to uh, okay. add, add to that. <laughs> Uh, well, on the um, on the measurement piece, because that's obviously where the, the rubber hits the road and where, as empiricists, I mean, Jeff, you and other economists, we want to be able to show things and provide evidence. So we need the data. And I think that's been, I mean, it's been a long time since Aristotle and even the Enlightenment. But it's, I think it's the data revolution that has really brought um, brought a lot of new life 
and will allow, I think, the field of well-being and what is the good life um, to take it to a whole new level, I think, is the, the availability of data. So the fact that the Office for National Statistics is measuring this as part of population statistics, the fact that the OECD is, OECD is pushing this, the fact that the United Nations recommends this to measure, be measured um, as a complement to GDP. So there's now these wonderful data sets, and that allows, I think, us to take the evidence to the next level. So how we measure it is absolutely critical. And as Richard says, I think we, there's this sort of an emerging consensus that we can measure this. Uh, the internal validity of the measure, the external validity of the measure, as Richard highlighted. And maybe if I can build on Richard on the measurement bit before we move on to other exciting topics, it's, well, how do we actually measure it? And then, Jeff, this will be very familiar to you because one of the ways to measure it is obviously by asking people, which is the, the one way to ask it. Uh, the one way to find out whether people feel good is obviously by asking them. And they are the ultimate sovereign uh, on this. Um, well-being is in the eye of the beholder. It is not me who can decide whether Jeff is happy. Even if I look at all your objective uh, the, uh, dimensions of your life, it's ultimately you. And I have to ask you whether you're happy. And I have to take that for granted and then reverse engineer to see, well, what helps explain uh, variants in between Jeff and his, and his family, et cetera. And what's interesting about these uh, measures of asking people is that, in fact, if you are asked to predict how a friend or someone else you know is or isn't happy, you actually come up pretty close yeah. when they report or when you look at them. So there's something real in this because it goes actually both ways. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so the external validity of these measures have now been studied, oh, thanks to many, many psychologists from the 80s and the 90s onward. We really have, we owe a lot to people like Ed Diener and Marty Seligman uh, and, and a whole crowd around positive psychology for digging into, do these measures, these feelings, these subjective well-being items, do they hold signal and not just noise? And you're absolutely right. There's a lot of, a lot of value to these numbers. And, and one thing that you emphasize and that is uh, key to this whole literature uh, and, and this whole field of study, I should say, is uh, two basic different kinds of subjective measures. So I think it'd be very good to, uh, yeah. to, to explain that. And, and possibly a third, which then links even more closely to Aristotle. So the first one, the one that we've chosen for the world, for our World Happiness Report, is uh, the evaluative dimension which is essentially satisfaction with life or the Cantor ladder, a more sophisticated version of that. Um, that's the and, one. and just to explain, what, what, what do people answer uh, in, ah. in trying to get at that? Yeah, so the World Happiness Report, as the three of us know very well, it, our, our friends at, at Gallup, who do representative surveys of, of populations uh, around the world and would ask the question, um, imagine a ladder with the top rung uh, of uh, being 10 and imagine that that is the best possible life for you and the bottom rung of zero is the worst possible life for you. Where do you think you stand nowadays on that ladder of life? So that's the Cantor ladder. And that's essentially evaluating or uh, evaluating the quality of your life uh, through your own eyes and how you experience it. Um, that's, that's, that's the evaluative approach to well-being. And then as you, as you rightly noted, there are all the um, other ways of measuring a well-being, which then um, come at it from a more emotional or affective way, which would then be, say, Jeff, are, are you happy right now? Or are you experiencing worry yesterday or today? And when we ask about yesterday, it's really just to get like a, a, um, a day and not be beholden to a specific time in the day. Um, so those are the affective measures. And then there's a third um, sort of dimension. It's a slightly more debated. In the book, we dig into this a little bit which comes closer to um, uh, what is then called eudaimonia, uh, referring back to Aristotle, which in the Office of National Statistics gets translated as, or a question as, do you find life worthwhile? So notions of purpose, worthwhile meaning, which has that virtue element to it. So is what you're doing, is your life worthwhile um, also to others or meaningful more generally? So that is, it's somewhat debated whether that is sort of a third angle onto subjective well-being. But it is being... Or, or something like part of the first uh, approach. Precisely, precisely. Yeah, because you could even say the first approach is a little bit reflection. Basically, on the whole, how's your life going? Uh, whereas the second, uh, you know, are you really annoyed because you're stuck in a traffic jam right now, which is uh, the emotions, or did, did you stub your toe or someone yelled at you and you feel miserable right now? Um, so... The, the emotional versus the this longer term. And I think it's in interesting to, to go back to uh, what Richard was saying uh, just a, a moment ago. Aristotle argued uh, on the same basis uh, as uh, both of you that, well, if you think about, is it wealth? Aristotle said, well, 
yeah, wealth is okay. It's not bad, but it, it's for something else. What's the one thing that isn't for something else, but is for itself? Uh, and that's, that's your well-being, uh, which, which, as you say, he called uh, eudaimonia, uh, maybe is the ancient Greek pronunciation, or eudaimonia, as we say right now. Uh, and then the question is all of these measurements. And boy, it, it is really a, a kind of revolution because Aristotle didn't have one data point. He was just mm -hmm. an incredibly clever observer and thinker uh, and very logical, but without a data point. Whereas now we have these Gallup surveys, which is really the basic measurement uh, that you're looking at uh, in this book um, in 150 countries or so and every year. And this is incredible, actually, to have that kind of, uh, th that kind of information available. And it is for the first time in history that this is being systematically collected on a, in a way that can be compared within a country in a, in a given time or across time within that country or across countries. So it's really remarkable. Well, surely it, it's a, the, the best description of what is the human situation on the planet. I, I, I love, we have right at the beginning, uh, a, a, a diagram of the distribution of happiness in the world. Uh, and you've got averages in Scandinavian countries uh, on a scale of 0 to 10, some, something like 8, nearly to 8. And you've got averages in countries like Af Afghanistan and South Sudan of 3. It's just incredible, the spread. And you can see that we're capturing in this something that is really corresponding to human experience. Yep. And it's never been done before. And, and in... The 2023 report, uh, people can find it online, but the top three reported countries of being on the ladder near the top rung, near rung 10, is Finland, Denmark, and Switzerland. And the three countries on the lowest rung reported, uh, as you just said, the very bottom is Afghanistan. And you know, we know that's a place that has just suffered terribly from... <laughs> Everything that can go wrong has gone wrong. Uh, and uh, Rwanda and Zimbabwe are uh, the, uh, the third from bottom, second from bottom, and, and Afghanistan. So you really see a spread that, that makes sense and that is rather consistent over time. There are changes, but when the changes occur within a country, you can say, oh, yeah, well, they became happier because there's some economic development going on or more life expectancy, or they became sadder because they're at war now. War has broken out again. Uh, and so you really can, can make sense of it. So I wanted to go to the second uh, big theme of the book, which I think is terrifically put, uh, which is you distinguish uh, in three chapters three big headings to think about uh, our well-being, um, our behavior, you say, our thoughts, how we think about life, and our genes uh, and uh, our physical natures, personality, and so forth. So could you uh, discuss, th these are kind of the big background factors, and then you take a deep dive into what these mean. But I think uh, we should talk about these three big factors that one is what what we're doing in our lives in our society the second uh, is how we're thinking about that and th and the third is uh, something maybe that we've inherited that we're uh, personality tending towards being happy or tending towards being oh my god i'm worried whatever it is so uh, could you could you take us through these uh, three big headings yes um maybe a good place to start is with the, the Nobel Address by our friend Daniel Kahneman, the psychologist, who was awarded the economics prize because what he had to say was very relevant to how we should think about political economy and, and how our lives should be organized. Was it, is it just enough to have laissez-faire, for example, leave everything to, to individual choice? So, so his, uh, his, his, I think it's almost his first statement is, uh, economists believe that people uh, are rational 
uh, consistent and selfish. And uh, psychologists don't believe that either of them. So if we, if we take uh, the, 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 the rational thing, you've got obvious counterexamples. You've got people who suffer from addiction who would like to stop doing something, but they can't stop doing it. Um, then you've got people who um, think that they'll gain something enormously from some change. Um, they don't know that they'll adapt to it. Uh, and that they will, in fact, have spent a lot, a lot of money on a bigger house. And in fact, they don't feel any different uh, after three months because they've got got used to it. Um, then you've got people who um, are extraordinarily uh, gullible, if you like, um, according to how a choice is presented to them. Uh, for example, um, are you going to opt into a pension plan um, if? Uh, the choice is presented to you, uh, uh, you have to say if you want to opt in. They find typically, for example, in one of these cases, something like 20% opted in. If you have to say, I'll opt in. If on the other hand, you're told you're in this pension plan, but you can opt out, uh, only about 20% opt out. So that 80% are opted in. So completely uh, inconsistent decisions uh, depending on the, some tiny little way in which the question uh, it, it, it is asked, um, and so on. So rationality is certainly not there, consistency is not there. And then are people selfish? Well, actually, they're not that selfish. Uh, there's a selfish element in everybody, but there's an extremely unselfish element in everybody. We, we, we couldn't really hope to have moral behavior from people unless they had... Uh, some strong feeling of sympathy for other people. They ex experienced other people's pain. They didn't like to see other people in pain. They liked to help other people. Uh, and incidentally, going back to your previous thing about eudaimonia, they also got some satisfaction from helping other people. So we need a, a much wider view about human behavior, which of course also includes the obvious point that society, by the way in which it steers things like pension plans or uh, uh, the, the whole setup of social support, um, can enormously influence uh, people's uh, ha happiness. Well, then we, then we go on to suppose things have happened to people. Um, how, how does that uh, actually affect their well-being? Uh, and one of the great discoveries um, of the last 50 years has been that the way people think about uh, their experience has a huge uh, inter effect in intermediating between the experience and the well-being that results. I'm, I'm going gonna, gonna to insist, uh, not discovery, but rediscovery, because the Stoics... The I'm, Stoics, I'm sure, knew, the I'm Stoics sure, I, knew it. <laughs> I, I, I was, I was, I'm quite happy to. Marcus Aurelius knew it as emperor in his meditations. I'm quite, quite, quite happy with that, but but I think that you know the, it's the combination of ancient wisdom, obviously Stoics, Buddhism, many things, yep. um, uh, with modern uh, cognitive behavioral uh, 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 psychology, positive psychology, um, are, are giving us uh, the tools to improve people's well-being through helping them think uh, more positively um, and focusing more positively on the situations uh, in which they find themselves. And, and Richard, if I may say, you, you've been really uh, pivotal uh, and transformative uh, in uh, insisting on uh, mental health interventions, especially uh, uh, by its technical term, cognitive behavioral therapy, helping people to think better about their situation. And so this is a case uh, not of uh, happy people being happier, but of people who are desperately unhappy or suffering from terrible anxieties or other uh, really debilitating conditions, being able to think, being able to be helped to think more clearly. If I could ask you to say something about that, because you've really been championing that for for 20 years now, and it's and it's and people are listening. One of the points you've made as an economist championing this is, this doesn't cost very much, and you really get a big impact. So that's been very persuasive. 
Yes. Well, we started uh, on this um, about 15 years ago, uh, and we made the case to the British government uh, that there were evidence-based therapies, not only uh, CBTs that we call cognitive it, behavioral but, therapy for people not only listening that, in, yeah. uh, but interpersonal therapy, brief psychodynamic therapies, which have strong uh, impacts on both depression or anxiety disorders like uh, OCD, PTSD, and so on, uh, panic attacks, phobias, um, really able to change lives, not of everybody who's treated, but uh, in, the, in the trials, the uh, success rates are, are over 50%, and we have found that in the service that we got the government to roll out, uh, we are also getting success rates of, of well over uh, 50% of people being relieved of symptoms that they've had for 20 years in many cases. So there's a huge, huge way in which here in which we can um, help people. Uh, and um, I think it's, it's, uh, it, it's something which benefits enormously from being well organized. And we, we I think, we're able in this program um, that to, to organize it in a way which is now being copied in seven different countries. So you have to have a very good training program to train people in these evidence-based therapies which are recommended by the, the uh, health authorities. Uh, and then you have to have really proper, well-organized services with very good supervision, but also, which was secret uh, of how success really, measure the outcomes and prove, therefore, you can prove that, that the money is not going down a black hole, but it's yeah. actually achieving something. So this has been a huge improvement, I think, in the attitude which uh, governments, but also you know, population have had to psychological therapy, that uh, we, we can show that it's not people going round and round circles, as some people have criticized some therapists for doing. It is producing forward movement. Jeff, if I may, um, you mentioned at the beginning of the question, there's also a, a biological, um, a, a genetic. Yes. Element. And I think it builds well on what Richard is saying. Yes, we can try and help people think better and that then improve their well-being. But we have to accept that there is a stable component to well-being as well, um, often called a set point, though that language is, 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 um, is not always accepted. Um, and the set point is essentially a genetic predisposition, if you will. And the way we figure this one out, and I've contributed a little bit to this line of the research, is through twin studies. It's actually very intuitive. If, uh, so we've got data sets where we've got, say, um, 600 uh, couples of non-identical twins and another 600 or so couples of identical twins. And then you look at their responses to life satisfaction or the Cantrell ladder. And what you find is that the identical twins, the covariance or the correlation between their responses is a lot stronger or quite a bit stronger than it would be between non-identical twins. So and it, actually, you point out something even, uh, e even stronger than that, which is that identical twins raised in separate households even that. are much closer than non-identical twins raised in the same household. Yeah. So it's really something. It, there's something there. And when you do these, um, these modeling and then you sort of reverse engineer to see what extent of the variance between people's well-being is explained by genetics, it's, it's about a third of all of the variants. So, we, so we, later on in the book, we'll talk about employment and marriage and age and what have you. And all of that has some impact. And it's typically sort of one, two, three percent of the R squared of the variants being explained. But genetics as a whole um, explains about a third of the lot. So yeah, huge. Which, um, which is a lot. Uh, I want to get to, get to the parts but, 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 that, but, but, I want to get but, to the parts but, but, that are, but, but, oh, sorry, sorry Richard. Could, yep. I just wanted to point out that, um, there's no, no sense at all um, in which if something uh, originates because of a genetic predisposition, that it's more difficult to, to change that than if it originates from a previous experience. These, both of these things can be equally uh, altered by appropriate psychological therapies or better experiences subsequently. Yeah, so, so Jeff, the point here is um, genetic predispositions are not deterministic. Right, exactly. no. you're not you're not locked into suffering no. or no. locked into happiness. It, all these other factors still matter 
for anybody, an identical twin or pair and, and, uh, and so on. I, I want to say as we move to the next part, which is really one wonderful chapter after another of the social and individual contributors to well-being th that, uh, again, I have to say, I, I feel a lot of resonance of what science is showing with what uh, Aristotle observed and uh, wrote because he didn't say everyone's rational and he didn't say everyone's irrational. He said, it's hard. We should try to think properly. Not everybody does. Uh, and he didn't have the term for addiction, but he, uh, the Greek term, uh, akratia, uh, is you don't have self-control. So he more or less describes the phenomenon uh, and uh, says we should be encratic, meaning uh, with self-control, we should use our minds to help us tame our, uh, our, our uh, surging, uh, otherwise uncontrollable desires that could do a lot of harm to people. So he had a kind of model of addiction or not addiction, um, but it was mainly saying, you know, at least we can help people and groups and even political communities move to well-being. And that, of course, is the, the bulk of, of your book, uh, which is uh, that well-being is explained by a variety of factors at the individual level, by things like a person's health, of course, mental and physical, by family, by schooling, which is, uh, Jan Manuel, one of your really uh, you know, focal areas of thinking about what happens in schools, what happens in the workplace, uh, and uh, because that's where we spend our days. So, of course, it shapes our, our well-being, unemployment, uh, your work relations, and so forth. So there's a lot, uh, there's a lot there, and actually every chapter is very rich uh, in practical evidence there is no one key to happiness. It's not, uh, uh, if you just think right, you'll be happy. Uh, uh, if you're just rich, obviously not. Uh, if, if you have a, a good job, it helps, but it doesn't guarantee and so forth. So um, how, how can we uh, t take this kind of overview? Uh, is there a way to summarize the broad uh, mix of factors. You have a lot of uh, diagrams showing many different things affecting happiness. How could we give, give an overview of, uh, of, of all of these factors uh, feeding in? Well, there, there are two ways in which you can, 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 can go at this. If, you, if you've got a population of people um, whose happiness is varying, um, you can try and say, well, some of these people uh, are in a, a really bad state. Uh, su suffering from what we might call misery below a certain level mm -hmm. of life satisfaction, as Jan was putting it. You could then say, what are the factors that are the main factors which are accounting for people being in that state? Um, and the, the, the answers uh, you know, which you get from a statistical analysis are the most the biggest single factor is, is mental health. A very simple question. Have you ever been diagnosed with mental uh, health problems of depression or anxiety? It's a very simple question. That's the biggest, biggest thing. Uh, physical illness is also a big thing. Chronic pain. Uh, having no partner, which is easy to measure. Loneliness. Yeah, very big loneliness factor. or... Divorce or other yeah, things yes. can cause and, people and, to suffer. And, and after all of those factors uh, is coming poverty. This is in rich societies, but it seems to be quite similar, the power of poverty to explain the, 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 the most miserable sections of uh, community, even in poorer countries. There are so many factors, personal factors, uh, which I feel governments in every country now have the tools to influence. Uh, they can influence what people's mental health is. They can influence whether they are abandoned and isolated uh, as, as well as whether they are poor. And we're going to have to have more concentration on uh, health policy, uh, on uh, social policy, as well as economic policy from governments 
uh, in every part of the world. The second question you could ask is, well, what's explaining the whole spread of happiness, in, including the upper reaches? It turns out they're the same factors. Mm-hmm. So, so asking the question, what are the main causes of misery, is a pretty good way into this subject. Since, since economists... Uh you know, generally start with the question, well, of course it's income, uh, because when, when we uh, train our students or read our introductory textbooks, and I remember it was many decades ago, uh, my introductory uh, course, I was told you have a, a financial budget constraint and that's going to determine what you can buy and that's going to determine what we call your utility. And there's some truth to it, but one of the uh, most important uh, findings, I think, and and Richard, you've also done uh, really interesting and important statistical work on this. Is uh, what's called the diminishing uh, marginal utility of money. And maybe Anna Manuel, could you just explain that concept and what what's the implication of it? Oh, thank you, Jeff. And um, Richard has a cool paper in Journal of Public Economics trying to get a measure for diminishing marginal utility of income. But in essence. It's the notion that at higher levels of of income or or household wealth, any additional uh, dollar or pound or euro will have a lower and lower marginal impact on your well-being. And that tapers off pretty quickly. So there's obviously a contentious debate. This is typically what well-being economists would be looking at, is, is this money make you happy? And there's no hiding behind the fact that at lower levels of income, adding 5,000 pounds or $5,000 to somebody who makes 20,000 is going to have a measurable positive impact on their life satisfaction. But add that $5,000 to somebody who makes 150,000 or 250,000, it has no impact whatsoever anymore. And so there's definitely sort of um, a a leveling off. um, uh, And depending on which measure you use, evaluations or uh, emotional well-being metrics, that sort of uh, satiation point or that leveling off happens a bit sooner or a bit later. And so Danny Kahneman, and Angus Deed and Richard, myself and others have been working on this. One point I wanted to make, which is um, uh, uh, one paper Andrew Oswald and I did put that question that economists always look at on its head. So rather than asking the question, does money make you happy? We said, well, maybe um, rich individuals were happier to begin with. So is, there's maybe even an, a reverse causality. So whatever you're finding in the, uh, as a coefficient on money to happiness may have been driven by happiness in the first place. Mm-hmm. And lo and behold, guess what we found? When you look at the well-being, life satisfaction, and emotional questions to adolescents, like we have data, like big panel studies out of the U.S., when they're 14, 16, 19, 21, you, get, you guess what? Their life satisfaction and well-being metrics are highly predictive of their earnings later on. So whatever you find in your coefficient of money making you somewhat happy, well, it could have been because you were happier to begin with. So it puts yeah. even more doubts on that question of uh, uh, money to happen. And I find myself, I find it so striking that even us economists have always thought of the taken societies, like have taken it on as, as if it can only be one direction, money to happiness, but never, I mean, our 2012 p paper was the first one to really put this properly on its head and ask the question, wait a second, how about reverse causality here? It's also very interesting, I'm gonna invoke the classics again, uh, that, uh, you know, there was a, there is a view in some religions and in some philosophies like Stoicism, that it's kind of all in your head, uh, or most of it. And I always liked Aristotle saying, you know, money is is not everything, that's not happiness, but it sure helps to have enough so that you're not suffering. So he really, he didn't express it as the diminishing marginal utility of uh, money, but he said, you need enough and, and in fact, implicitly, you said you need enough to be able to be a philosopher, you know, <laughs> to, have, to have time to think, to have time for leisure, uh, not to uh, be completely overwhelmed with trying to just put food on the plate. Um, and so he had that idea. And I always like that, that it's uh, because there are always extremes in everything we're talking about. One extreme is it's all money. And, and uh, I think this whole field that you're leading is has moved moved the discussion away from that very naive idea. But that idea was around, and it's still in a lot of people's heads. Uh, I just got to get rich. That's the only way I'm going to be happy. On the other hand, there's the other extreme, which is, you know, it doesn't matter at all. It's just uh, I, I can accept anything. 
And life doesn't work that way either. Uh, it, it's really something in the middle. Uh, and, um, and, and it also belies one of the fears about this whole line of study and whole line of approach, which uh, our dear friend and colleague and Nobel laureate Amartya Sen always worried about, which is, well, you'll talk poor people into being satisfied. Uh, and uh, that's what's dangerous about this uh, because, you know, uh, the, the poor person will be told you should just be satisfied. But it's not like that either, really. Uh, poor people want enough that they're uh, financially comfortable. Uh, now, you, you, you raised a very, very interesting point, and there's a whole discussion about it in the text, which is that many things contribute to happiness, but happiness contributes to many practical things as well. And you've just mentioned one, that if young people are happy, it turns out that's not only predictive, but probably causal, that they're going to be more successful later on because they'll take on more challenges, they'll invest, they'll be more sociable, they'll be more aspirational. But you point out many areas where the causation is not to happiness, but from happiness to better outcomes. And I wonder if you could just take us through a few of those because they're fascinating. Yeah, well, Jeff, it's um, remember in 2014, I think, in our World Happiness Report, we, we sort of rounded up all of that evidence and we, we call it the objective benefits of subjective well being. And that kind of is a good segue, I think, into this material. But you're absolutely right. So there's a lot of these positive spillover effects of being able to raise well-being. We mentioned one, doing better in sort of job, job outcomes and the salaries attached to it later on, and your intuitions were spot on, and we were able to um, find the ways in which and why that is, like people become more sociable, and more opportunities coming their way, they're more likely to be promoted if they are in a, in a, uh, have, have a positive vibe around them. Other elements uh, down the line consequence would be better health. Richard mentioned longevity uh, and better health behaviors. Um, more pro-social behaviors, people who are happier are more likely to donate, more likely to uh, volunteer their time, etc. The one that I focused a lot of time on, and I'm pleased to say literally today, online on management science, the paper has finally come out, is the, the, um, the example of the link between how you feel and how productive you are at work right, there, right then. So we've, for the first time, been able to causally nail uh, through a massive uh, field experiment in collaboration with British Telecom, to show that if you feel better from one week to another, um, that has a massive impact on, say, weekly sales. How could you? How could you do that? That sounds ah, like a. Okay. In, <laughs> now, how uh, much time do we have, Jeff? I'll be very brief. The way we've yeah. been able to do this is by leveraging the weather differences around the call centers of BT. So, you, you're going to love this. It took us three years to get to causal evidence. And, and the referees really push on this. And it's not just the weather differences around the call centers when the call center employees came in that influenced their well-being, which was sort of the exogenous shock on them there. Um, um, in other words, if the weather is bad, people it, are, yeah. are down. We're down. So we, and then if they're down, then you look at how productive they are. Exactly, yeah. But in a way that the weather won't affect directly. Exactly. Right. So yeah, the yeah. calls that were coming in from were, from a, were around the country and so right. you look at local, not about the local weather precisely right. <laughs> but, but the referees pushes one step further it wasn't just the weather impact as the call center police walked in to door that morning lo the local weather they forced us to go one step further also look at the exposure so the 16 call centers we had to nail down the extent of window coverage to see <laughs> how the, the the interaction between the weather that day and the exposure to it to improve the accuracy of the effects so when it was bad weather and there was a lot of exposure to it because it was lots of glass windows. Um, we, the effect was stronger than it was bad weather and there was little exposure to the weather. Wow. And so we were able to, anyway, you see where I'm heading with this. <laughs> but um, so it was quite something to, to nail this, but we're, we're there. So there's now a causal effect, feel evidence for the link between how we feel and how productive we are. Phenomenal. Richard, one of the things uh, that you have uh, been leading on and I'd like you to uh, describe it is a, a kind of grassroots level uh, effort to help people in communities to uh, find higher levels of well-being in part by getting together to uh, build social connections, trust, networking, uh, and, and so on. One of the themes uh, of Aristotle is uh, that our, our relations with others, whether they're virtuous, trustworthy, and so forth, 
actually raises our own well-being, and this is a, a big theme of the textbook also. Describe how community plays a role in all of this and, and what the implications are for how we should think about this issue rather than one individual at a time, but actually in building community. When you started on the, on the movement, let me just say a little about the movement, then we come to community in general. But um, we live in a, 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 a largely secular age, um, so that the ethics that used to come to people through religion are not coming on, on, on the back of that. They need to come on the back of something else. And uh, we believe that that should be the great enlightenment uh, ideal, that the way you should live is to try and uh, contribute whatever you can to the happiness uh, of the world around you. And, and so the, the driving force for that movement that you mentioned... And what is the name of the movement so it's, people it's can called, look it up? It's, it's called Action for Happiness, mm -hmm. Action for Happiness. Um, the, the, uh, the pledge that all the members take is, I will try to create as much happiness as I can in the world and as little unhappiness. And I think that's a really inspiring um, message coming from the Enlightenment. Um, and, you know, we, we're seeing in particular at the moment uh, adolescents and young adults who are terribly uncertain about what they should be doing in their lives. I think that this is an incredibly important and stabilizing message. But it's a message for all of us. So the question is, you know, how can we live well? <laughs> uh, it's not easy to, to, to live a, a, a good, balanced, and, and relatively unselfish life without some framework that helps to keep you all, um, uh, motivated. And that, that's the idea of actual happiness. People will come together uh, on a regular basis around the, 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 the ideal <laughs> of how they're trying to, trying to live, uh, all of us imperfectly, uh, and how we can be sustained uh, in coping with our own inner demons uh, and helping other people um, in their lives and with, maybe with some of their problems too. So people uh, meet regularly, but having taken, uh, obviously, uh, some sort of course through which they learn um, the, the secrets of how to live a, a good life, which is satisfying to you and to the people around you. And now, and now they have a textbook so, so this, for that this, also. This, this course, <laughs> this course, uh, Jeff, has been subjected to a trial. And, and uh, these are the re remarkable results um, that after this uh, eight-session course, um, uh, two months afterwards, people are still uh, as, as much happier as a result of the course uh, as if they had found a partner for life uh, or a job from being unemployed. So there's, there's, there's an awful lot that can be done, not by experts teaching, but this is volunteer-led. There are also, of course, very good courses online. But coming back to your more general uh, point about community, um, of course... Uh, we are social animals. Your friend Aristotle, I think, was yeah. the first person to yes. use, use that for us. Zoan um, politikan, we, as, as uh, they we, said we are, in the we are getting, we're, we're getting our enjoyment from interaction with other people. We are getting our support from other people. We're getting our sense of identity uh, from other people. Um, and uh, it, 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 it's, it's been shown many times over that the, how long people live depends on how, the strength of their social connections uh, when they're um, measured earlier in their life. Okay, bye. Um, and, and, and the... Richard? Uh, uh, the, the, Richard? The thing which, uh, uh, of course, uh, is a way of expressing your commitment to the community is to volunteer your services um, to help in local associations, even sports clubs or uh, helping other people who are in, in, in trouble. Yeah, so. one, one of the interesting things uh, you point out is arts and sports are very real. Oh, of course they are, but, uh, but, but actually they show up uh, empirically as very important builders of community. They do. We've just had a very interesting experience in the lockdown here. Um, 
because uh, people were encouraged to volunteer to help people who were isolated, doing their shopping, taking them to hospital. Uh, and there was huge oversubscription of volunteers. And there was a random allocation who was asked uh, to do the volunteering. Wow. And, and uh, it was found that the people who did the volunteering increased their uh, life satisfaction quite substantially relative to other people. So uh, We should as, explain to listeners that any time there's a random allocation, economists see an opportunity to study the effect of that. <laughs> and uh, so you have been able to use that to see whether those who were lucky to get into this desirable situation actually achieved a, a higher level of well-being. And they, yes. Yes, they did. And they did. So, so, so this is one what one aspect of community that gives you an opportunity uh, to help other people. As the Dalai Lama always says, uh, I, I, I benefit uh, as much as the people that I help uh, when that happens. Let's uh, turn to uh, the conclusions uh, of the book, which is uh, government, uh, because you give a lot of assignments to government to say you have to do things differently. In view of all of this evidence, uh, you know, what are you doing chasing variables, GDP or whatever it is that when you could really be helping directly by measurement and then by policies to promote well-being in the society? So, uh, and, and you show also uh, the studies that show if governments do that, they actually benefit as well by focusing on well-being. Uh, maybe you could describe that two-way uh, result uh, as, as we conclude the talk right now. Maybe Anna Manuel to come in on that. You, you go first, and I'll go. Yeah. I, I will. So yeah, so in two chapters, one called how government affects well-being, and then the opposite direction, how uh, how uh, how well-being affects voting and, and political behavior. Um, we sort of round up all the evidence. And it's quite striking that quality of government, uh, whether it's government effectiveness, rule of law, regulatory quality, or control of corruption, is very positively associated, obviously, with well-being. Maybe not comes a, will not come as a surprise. There's probably a lot of um, um, other covariants, but still, there's definitely something very powerful about what governments can do um, about themselves to improve the well-being. And, 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 and I think it's uh, you know very important and striking. And I think probably everyone uh, listening can feel it also. When our government's misbehaving, when it's cheating, when it's corrupt, you really feel bad. <laughs> about, uh, not only about that, but it really is depressing, actually. I mean, it's very annoying. I couldn't agree more. And I'm literally looking at the graph on page 258, where we look at um, the quality of, of, you know, democratic quality of governments, whether it's voice and accountability or political stability, which kind of refers to the point you're making. And the correlation is just massive. And obviously Denmark, Sweden yeah, do very well. And then you've got places like, you know, Bangladesh, Tanzania, well, Tanzania, fine, but others at the bottom. And you can tell it, it impacts negatively population well-being. But then when you turn it around, what I think is really ultimately going to get the policymakers interested in this is there some, or the politicians, even more than the policymakers. Or the, the, the politicians yeah. uh, is obviously their, their self-interest, which tends to be focused on uh, staying in power or re-election. Um, and what we found here is uh, thanks to one fantastic work by George Ward, and then Rich and I have contributed a little bit to that in later stages, is the idea that if you look at um, levels of well-being uh, prior to elections from one sort of electoral period to another, you find that nothing, literally nothing, better predicts how the incumbent vote goes, then subject to well-being, measures of life satisfaction. And we compare and contrast that to the traditional stuff, inflation, GDP, unemployment level, even, even sort of ethnic, ethnic mix of, of the local populations. And you find that, yes, these matter, but well-being, how people feel, is obviously how um, they interpret the outside world around them. These changes, economic and social, they interpret that, it sort of crops it up in their subjective well-being, and that's what gets out on the vote. Uh, gets on, on, on the, um, so as, as, as one of the uh, cartoons in the book uh, emphasize, it's, it's not the economy, stupid, it's the well-being. Precisely, yeah. Yeah, it, and it, it's really important. And that brings us to uh, uh, the... 18th chapter, uh, very uh, important. And Richard, uh, you talk about how governments should think about what they're doing and think yeah, about it differently I mean, from what they're doing. Tell us what a well-being so, is. So going back to the great enlightenment ideal, yeah. we want governments 
to uh, direct their policies to maximize the well-being uh, of the population. Uh, Thomas Jefferson said, the care of human life and happiness is the sole legitimate objective of government. Absolutely right. You can't think of any other, provided the happiness is relatively fairly distributed. So we have been campaigning to try to get governments to make uh, well-being their goal. Um, of course, some governments have started using this language as uh, a well-being economy governments alliance, which was in, led by originally New Zealand, now has Finland uh, and uh, other countries in it. Um, and the idea should be uh, that if you imagine a country with a given budget, how do they spend their money? They should be evaluating all the policy uh, proposals uh, that are coming their way uh, in terms of the well-being generated per dollar of expenditure. That's the proper measure of cost effectiveness uh, that we are pushing. Um, the, um, in, in, in our own country here, uh, we now have a, a, the leader of the opposition who may become the prime minister in two years, we don't know. He has said that he will require the Treasury, the Finance Ministry, uh, to evaluate all policies in terms of their effects uh, on well-being uh, as well as growth. So um, this could be an interesting uh, experiment in, in really applying some of the principles in this book. But we're trying to promote this idea worldwide. Um, uh, we have, uh, and we're involved, Jan and myself, uh, in a new movement called the World Wellbeing Movement, uh, which is uh, centred in Jan's Institute, uh, but a worldwide movement, uh, to get countries to adopt wellbeing uh, as their, their, their goal uh, for their governments and, 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 and of course, as a, a major purpose also for any, any organisation, be it a business or a school, because this is such a general principle. And that's, that's I think, what, where we should, should be ending this conversation, isn't it, Jeff? That this is something which overrides everything. It, just, it relates to everything. The whole of life is, is involved in, uh, in, in, in contributing to the well-being of the people. And therefore, if we think well-being is a goal, uh, that is influencing, you know, how we should conduct every aspect of life. Well, this is a, a wonderful place to uh, not end, but to take a pause uh, and uh, for me to thank you. We've been speaking uh, about well-being, science and policy with Professor Richard Laird of the London School of Economics and Professor Jan Emanuel Genev. This is a wonderful, wonderful book. It's going to sit on the bookshelf next to the Nicomachean Ethics and the politics, <laughs> uh, and it's going to make a, a major contribution. And I'm sure that people all over the world are going to be reading it with, the, with tremendous benefit. So thank you both so much for the book and so much for the conversation today on Book Club with Jeffrey Sachs. It's been great to be together with you. Thank you. Well, and thank you, Jeff. Thank, thank you, Jeff. Bye-bye, everybody.